Welcome to this educational activity where Dr. Robert Sidbury from Seattle Children's Hospital and the University of Washington School of Medicine and Dr. Ruchi Gupta from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and the Ann and Robert H. Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago share insights on diagnosing and treating atopic dermatitis. Also joining Drs. Sidbury and Gupta is Mr. Aidan Boomer, a patient with atopic dermatitis. The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled A Closer Look at the Atopic Dermatitis Patient Journey, Effective Management Approaches Across the Age and Disease Spectrum. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash XHY860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. My name is Aiden, and I was born with severe atopic dermatitis. Uh, growing up with uh, atopic dermatitis, you have a much different childhood from, I'd say, uh, the ordinary person. At least I did. I would spent a lot of time at Seattle Children's Hospital and at my normal doctor's office getting treatments. And growing up as a, as a kid with this condition, there's something to other kids and even adults that's obviously different about you. And so I think there's a sort of otherness that, uh, that comes with growing up with something visibly different about you. And I think when you're a kid, it's important to, it's important to catch this thing early because if you can at least reduce the visibility of atopic dermatitis, then it, it has a, a really positive psychological effect on, on, the, on the patient, speaking from personal experience. Because as a kid, I'd, I often spend the nights sort of scratching my skin open and in pain, and then I'd wake up sort of unable to move my, move my arms. And you know, you could, see, you could see the damage. So then as a kid, you'd go to school, you know what I'm saying, and you just kind of feel like, I'm different. I'm different from everybody else somehow, and it's really obvious to you and everybody else. And I think growing up with any condition, on your, especially on your skin, where everyone can just see it, there's no way to, to avoid the residual effects, like the insecurity you have growing up. So that was really tough for me as, as a kid growing up with atopic, uh, severe atopic dermatitis. I was around 16 years old, 16 or 17, when I finally uh, got to a treatment that actually worked. And uh, just the switch from the visibility, like I got firsthand experience what it was like to live with and without visible atopic dermatitis. I was diagnosed when I was just too young to even remember, so throughout my entire life I had atopic dermatitis and I was living with it and I was dealing with it and after a while it did get easier, but before even this one treatment it was to the point where I think an ordinary person who didn't grow up with atopic dermatitis would have probably uh, would have probably described it as, as a horrible thing to live with. As far as um, residual effects physically, like there's definitely a, there's definitely a benefit to uh, starting an effective treatment early because even now there are effects still on my skin that I can see from damage caused when I was a, when I was a child. So there's no limits to there's no limits to the benefits that getting an early diagnosis and effective treatment early on can really have on a patient. Um, it it pretty much impacts every part of your life from uh, schoolwork to sleep loss. I was pretty much always exhausted as a kid. I remember getting almost no sleep just from scratching almost all the time. So of course uh, w with that, other than just the physical effects and the um, effects on sleep loss, you kind of grow up with sort of this embedded insecurity about yourself because you don't, you're not really old enough to understand why something is different about you or, or why that doesn't like mean anything about you as a person. But I think with anyone with this condition, it's super difficult to sort of reconcile that within yourself when you're too young to really understand <clears throat> the unfairness of life. It's so time consuming from going to treatment all the time and seeing doctors trying to figure out what's going on, especially in the time period that I grew up, which was the early 2000s where the, the treatments weren't even where they are now. But I tried pretty much every uh, topical ointment that is available for eczema. I tried light therapy, which ended up just pretty much causing me to scratch all the skin off my legs, so that was a bad idea. Um, I tried a bunch of different diets to no avail. I tried uh, naturopathic treatments, Eastern medicine, which was um, also did nothing. So uh, as a result of just having no effect from all of, all of these treatments for my entire life, I got a bunch of infections, MRSA, staph, uh, that I would have to take uh, st uh, steroids for all the time, antibiotics when I would get them. And then, you know, that didn't help, not being able to do certain things with my friends, not being able to go in pools sometimes. It was just, 
it's something that you don't realize unless you're in it that it really stretches its fingers to every corner of your life and has an effect on pretty much everything that you try to do. So it's not, it's not the kind of thing where it's like some people uh, a lot of the time will confuse it with sort of psoriasis or other like even smaller uh, skin conditions where they're easily treatable and a mild inconvenience. But when you have uh, atopic dermatitis, especially if it's severe and especially if you're young, I think it's something that is, yeah, just like I said, like time consuming to the point where it pretty much is all encompassing of everything you do all the time. So uh, I think even if I had had the medication that's available today or the resources that are available today, even when I was a kid, it might have helped growing up as a, uh, in a better state of mind, even if uh, let alone a better physical state. So I think uh, the benefits of early effective treatment and early diagnosis can't be overstated because my life, I just I feel like could have been so different if even the tools that are available now were available to me then. Um, speaking of which, uh, current treatments are uh, so much better than they used to be even when I was a kid. So I'm on a, a drug right now, which was pretty much the only thing that had really worked for me my entire life. If young kids were able to get this effective treatment much earlier on, I can just imagine the effect it would have on them growing up in a more healthy state of mind, in a, a more rested state. Probably, I know sleep loss is a common thing amongst other atopic dermatitis patients, so that's a big one. As far as its impact on my health in other areas, I also have a, a few food allergies, which I believe are connected to my atopic dermatitis. I have an allergy to peanuts and as well as mangoes. Also, uh, I'm allergic to cats and dogs, so I'm not sure about its effect, but it definitely has long-lasting residual effects on your body as well as your skin later on in life. My hope moving forward is that kids growing up with atopic dermatitis today might have earlier access to more effective medicines and tools than I did growing up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aiden, for sharing your story. So let's take Aiden's story and go back to before he can even remember back to when he was an infant, first showing up to the pediatrician with eczema for the first time. Probably started as a rash on his body, probably extensor surfaces and on his face, and probably asked the pediatrician what to do. So what's important here is pediatricians are front lines. They're the ones who are seeing these infants when the first signs of atopic dermatitis begin. Pediatricians see infants at their well child check visits at two months, four months, six months, nine months, and a year. So they are the first ones to start to manage and treat their eczema. So let's talk about atopic dermatitis. Now, atopic dermatitis is defined as a chronic, pruritic, inflammatory skin disorder with frequently remitting and relapsing course that has been shown to affect about 15 to 20% of the pediatric population worldwide, about 13% of children in the United States. Atopic dermatitis commonly presents by five years with the highest incidence between three and six months of age. One third of children with atopic dermatitis actually have severe atopic derm. Now, most atopic derm resolves by the time you reach adulthood, but about 10 to 30% of children go on to continue their atopic dermatitis into adulthood. How does the pediatrician then truly assess and determine the severity of atopic derm? Now, atopic derm presents differently in infants, children, and adults. In infants, you typically see it between like we said, three to six months on the extensor surfaces of the skin and on the face. As they get older, in children, you tend to see it more on, again, the face, but now on the flexor regions. And then into adulthood, it continues in the flexural extremities, as well as on the hands and the dorsum of the feet. Here's some pictures of the clinical manifestations of atopic dermatitis. Here it is in lighter skinned patients. And here it is in darker skin patients. So it can appear very differently. So the very important question for pediatricians is how do you assess and manage eczema severity? Now, there are some complex scoring tools out there that are difficult to do in a pediatric practice, but we'll go through one of the most common ones called the SCORAD system. 
Now the score ad system takes into account three main things. One, the body surface area, so the extent of eczema on the patient's skin. Two, the intensity. Now intensity is rated on a number of different areas, so redness, and it goes from none, mild, moderate, to severe. Swelling, oozing, crusting, scratch marks, uh, skin thick thickening, and dryness. Now all of these things, categories, make up the intensity, and they can all go from none to severe, as seen in this image. The third piece is the subjective piece, and this is the patient's recollection of itching, pruritus, and the severity of that, and sleep loss. As Aiden says, it's one of the most common reasons for losing sleep because you're itching. Oftentimes, it's called the itch that rashes. So taking all three of these areas into account, the body surface area, the intensity, and then the subjective symptoms of the patient, you compile a score and determine the severity. Now because this is not practical in the pediatrician's office, there are simpler tools for assessing atopic derm. One is this, the IgA atopic derm scale. And this goes from zero to four as being severe. And there is a group of symptoms that fit the same criteria that we talked about that a patient may fall into. For example, mild is slight but definite erythema, slight but definite induration or papulation, and then of course the skin thickening and the oozing or crusting. Severe, however, now you have the marked erythema and marked induration or papulation and marked thickening. So again, it's, it's a scale and oftentimes it's very subjective by the, the physician or the pediatrician assessing it. So examples of what would be called mild eczema are hyperpigmented, hypopigmented skin, no crusting or oozing, and just barely any thickening or swelling. When we think about moderate eczema, we sometimes think about a little bit more of each of these. So duller red skin, clear swollen, raised or thickened skin, and mild oozing or crusting. And then again, now we're getting into severe eczema. You see that bright red or deep red skin, very swollen, raised or thickened skin, oozing and crusting, and widespread across the body surface area. So as Aiden also described, atopic conditions often run together. And they all start with atopic derm as being the first sign. These children are more likely to develop other atopic conditions like allergic rhinitis or food allergies and asthma. So all of these conditions together are called the atopic march. You don't need to or develop them for sure, but you have a higher chance of developing one if you have that atopic derm as an infant. Some new hypotheses that have recently been better understood include this one. This is the dual allergen hypothesis. And what this says is that if you have broken skin, and if an infant at a young age is actually exposed to food, specifically peanut products or peanut proteins through the skin first, they have a higher likelihood of developing a peanut allergy. Whereas if they ingest peanut products into their gut first, their immune system will go the normal way and they will be tolerant or be able to eat the peanut products. So this finding was really significant. There was a recent uh, manuscript published in 2015 in the New England Journal called the LEAP study where they actually took infants with high severity and by high severity we mean severe eczema or already a history of egg allergy. And so for these infants they randomized them and the half of them had peanut products on a regular basis and the other half did not. Now what they found was that there was an 80% reduction in development of peanut allergy for those infants who were fed peanuts on a regular basis. Now this was groundbreaking because it was the first time we saw that by identifying early atopic dermatitis in infants and providing them with peanut products early in life, we could actually prevent the other comorbidities that may go along with atopic derm, including peanut allergy. Now these findings were so significant that it led to the NIH to bring together a group of experts to determine the guidelines in the United States. And what the guidelines say is that 
pediatricians need to assess infants at the four-month visit. Now at that four-month well child check, if that infant has severe eczema, that infant needs to be managed. And that means give them treatment for their eczema, but also the pediatrician needs to assess either a specific IgE to peanut. Now, if that number comes back positive, that infant needs to be referred to an allergist immediately. The pediatrician can also just refer that infant to an allergist to be assessed. If the infant has moderate eczema or mild eczema, then they need to be encouraged to start peanut products at home as soon as possible around the six month time period. Those with severe eczema are at high risk for developing peanut allergy just like Aiden did. And this is really important to understand because for the first time pediatricians have the opportunity to prevent peanut allergy in infants. All children, however, mild to moderate, should be encouraged to start peanut products early around that six month time period. Now, back to Aiden's story. Atopic derm has such an impact on the quality of life of a child. Quality of life studies have been done in atopic dermatitis children, and it's found that, as Aiden said, it is such an impact on sleep. So these children are itching all night long and really sleep deprived, which also impacts their school. It also impacts participations in sports and extracurricular activities, as he mentioned, because oftentimes you can see it and kids can not always be nice. It can affect their clothing choice because they don't like to show areas of their skin that may be affected, and it can often affect their social interactions. In fact, in some studies, parents have reported that eczema actually has a really big impact on their child's quality of life at school. 91% of parents said that their child had trouble at school because of their eczema. Half said that it was difficult to treat the child's eczema during the school day. And half said that their child is exposed to eczema triggers at school, which make it worse. Additionally, a third said that their child had difficulty concentrating in class due to their eczema. One of the quotes was that he tries to just be a regular kid, but it's hard when he's a kid with eczema. Other parents and teachers often don't understand or misunderstand the eczema. Again, over half of parents said that my child's teacher doesn't understand eczema, and my child can't easily excuse himself or herself from the class to go to the school's nurse's office to help treat the eczema. Another quote says, there are constant stares and questions from people on what's wrong with her skin. Additional parent perspectives, another quote, it's exhausting for the ones suffering from eczema and for their caregivers. Eczema affects the entire family's quality of life in such visible ways. 57% said, my significant other and I feel guilty that our child has this eczema. Over half said, my whole family's sleep is affected by my child's eczema. And almost half said, the medications and therapies that my child needs for their eczema greatly impact their family budget. Atopic derm, especially when severe or poorly controlled, may be associated with psychosocial distress and psychiatric comorbidities. This is driven by multiple factors, including the severe itching, loss of sleep, and social embarrassment. Due to this, it's important that atopic derm is treated appropriately and quickly. As pediatricians, we're on the front lines to assess atopic derm in infants, and it is our job to manage it appropriately and to refer them as needed to the dermatologist or to allergists so that they can protect that skin barrier as early as possible to potentially prevent other comorbidities. This will help children like Aiden live better lives and potentially reduce other associated conditions. Thank you. Hello, my name is Robert Sidbury, and I'm a pediatric dermatologist at Seattle Children's Hospital. My two least favorite words to put together are just eczema. Just eczema is anything but when you hear stories like Aiden's and you hear presentations like Dr. Gupta's who describe what this disease can mean to patients and their families. Just eczema is oftentimes put together in the context of, oh, you can just put a little lotion on and it'll go away, or just eczema, your child's going to grow out of it. 
Well, you just heard Aiden uh, still dealing with this condition at his age. Clearly, he didn't grow out of it. And so it's a condition where if you start putting together those two words for parents and families, you're oftentimes going to lead to some false expectations and you're gonna minimize a condition that is causing kids to lose sleep every night, to be uh, ostracized at school, uh, to not be able to wear the types of clothes and things they wanna wear, and otherwise are impacted on a daily uh, basis by this condition. And so my hope is by the end of this presentation and this series of presentations, uh, you will think it's anything but just eczema. What my role is here today is to talk about the goals of treatment. First and foremost, atopic dermatitis or eczema, terms which I'll use synonymously, is an inflammatory skin disease. It is inflammation. You've heard of the term eczema is the itch that rashes. If you've seen patients with eczema, you've had stories of parents saying their child went to sleep looking pretty well, pretty good, their skin was in decent shape, and they woke up sometimes a bloody mess. It is the itch that rashes because there's inflammation under the skin that triggers the itch. And that's our goal number one of treatment is to stop that inflammation. Goal number two is to prevent it from recurring. And goal number three is to do this safely and sustainably. There are foundations of care in terms of addressing these goals that are true for every single patient with atopic dermatitis, whether they have mild atopic dermatitis, moderate or severe. First and foremost, those are to avoid triggers. You heard Dr. Gupta's presentation discussing things like peanut allergy. There are things that are more irritant in nature, uh, like wool clothing, that are incredibly irritating for skin um, that patients with atopic dermatitis just simply can't wear without uh, causing their skin to be irritating. Those are things that oftentimes parents and patients will tell me as the provider, rather than me having to go and hunt uh, with tests and that sort of thing to figure out. But whether they're tested and identified or whether they're self-reported, avoiding triggers is a critical piece of managing atopic dermatitis. Second is moisturizing the skin. Um, that's going to be true for a child uh, uh, one week of age with a history of atopic dermatitis or a risk of atopic dermatitis to a patient Aiden's age. Uh, moisturizing the skin is critical. And then finally, controlling inflammation is the last piece. Uh, and that's something that's done both with these foundational efforts of avoiding triggers and moisturizing the skin and healing the barrier, and when those things aren't enough, pharmacologic options, which we'll talk about. First and foremost, there are treatments which are non-pharmacologic. You don't need a prescription for them. And the first that I want to talk about is bathing and moisturization, something seemingly incredibly simple, but which causes an amazing amount of confusion among parents and oftentimes providers as well. And I'm here to tell you there's not a stitch of evidence to support a bathing frequency, whether it's once a day or once a week, as being the best uh, routine for atopic dermatitis. It matters what you put in the bath and it matters what you do afterwards as to whether or not a bath is going to be helpful or harmful. If a child bathes, I want them to moisturize immediately afterwards. I will tell kids who are old enough and I want them to listen to their parents and buy into the program that when any of us get into a bath or a pool or a shower and we're in long enough, the thickest skin on our hands shows it. It shows it by turning into a raisin-like look or, or very wrinkled palms or, or, or soles, and that can be a marker for hydration of the skin everywhere. And the goal then is to, once the skin is hydrated adequately, as indicated by those wrinkled palms, baths over more or less, the child gets out, pat dry, and then something on all of their skin before those fingertips unwrinkle essentially sealing in that moisture rather than letting it evaporate. And that evaporative water loss is what is so harmful for the skin. And that's why when you hear you shouldn't bathe with atopic dermatitis, that's what that idea is getting at. If you bathe but do not moisturize afterwards, absolutely. The less bathing you do, the better off you'll be. If you bathe and moisturize immediately afterwards, generally speaking, that's going to be beneficial. And so that's a critical, fundamental, foundational concept that I spend a good deal of time talking about in a first visit of mine with a patient with atopic dermatitis. Well, there are also some adjunctive things that you can add to baths. Sometimes parents will say, gosh, I'm putting in some uh, oatmeal products. And that's fine. Oatmeal products in the bath can be soothing. They're not terribly therapeutic 
unlike bleach baths. And if you've heard of the concept of bleach baths, I always know when a parent has not heard of bleach baths because I would have spent so much time talking about avoiding triggers and wearing light, loose-fitting cotton clothing, avoiding allergens, being super cautious uh, with the child's skin, and then, oh, by the way, put a little bleach in their bath. And they instantly think I'm crazy and will need to have that contextualized, and that's really important when you introduce bleach baths. Otherwise, parents are likely not to engage in them. And what I will say is that a little bit of bleach in a bath is not unlike a little chlorine in a pool. It is meant to potentially kill bacteria, though in the context of bleach baths, really, it seems to have more of an anti-inflammatory effect than an anti-staph effect. After the bath is over, you rinse off so the last water doesn't have any bleach in it, and then you engage in your post-bath routine like we already talked about. This can be an unbelievably helpful adjunctive therapy to minimize the need for actual pharmacologic agents uh, for the atopic dermatitis, which we'll talk about now. Well, there was a wonderful paper presented a couple years ago uh, out of Denver that used the term yardstick, a yardstick for the treatment of atopic dermatitis, which basically provided an algorithm of options, both topical and systemic, for treatments of atopic dermatitis. And I've used that term ever since that paper came out. In terms of the yardstick of topical treatments, which is where we always start with atopic dermatitis, the first and most time-honored therapy are topical steroids. Topical steroids have been around for many years. We're very familiar with them, and they are first-line treatment. Second-line treatment for, top for atopic dermatitis are topical calcineurin inhibitors, agents called pemecrolimus and tacrolimus, and they are proved down to two years of age for patients with atopic dermatitis. They are used on the face, on the body, wherever they're needed, and they can be alternated with topical steroids to minimize overuse of either. Topical steroid one week, topical calcineurin inhibitor the next week, if daily treatment is necessary and taking a break is not possible with just monotherapy. Third line would be a newer product, a topical phosphodiesterase inhibitor, a product called Crisiborol. And this is a non-steroidal product, which also can be used for atopic dermatitis, also approved down to two years of age. Well, do these products have any risks associated with their use? Well, of course they do. Every medicine does, uh, all the way down to acetaminophen that we take for a headache. Well, topical steroids, the problems are both of perception and reality. Perception is steroid phobia. Um, that term steroid is a loaded one. Um, when I use the term steroids with a parent, oftentimes what's conjured are uh, athletes being banned from their sport for use of steroids. So a lot of times you'll have to do some, some education as to the difference between systemic steroids and topical steroids. And then there are real risks as well, especially in younger kids where there's more body surface area relative to their mass. Topical steroids can be absorbed to the point where they can actually suppress their own ability to make steroids, which we do every day, so-called HPA axis suppression. We don't see this very often, but it's something that we at least consider as a possible side effect. What we hear about, but also don't see very often, but talk about every single visit, at least uh, first visits, is thinning of the skin with topical steroids. What is thinning of the skin, and do we need to worry about it? Well, it's real, it can happen, but I think what parents need to know is that thinning of the skin in its first stages is entirely reversible, because that's what parents don't want, is they don't want a bell they can't unring. They don't want five years to pass and there's a scar in their child's skin for something that, oh, was going to go away anyway, which we know may or may not have been the case. But thinning of the skin comes in stages. The first stage is a little blood vessel, not unlike if you look at your wrist and see blood vessels there, though they're usually finer, more like telangiectasias, or almost like the broken capillaries we'll see on our face sometimes. Um, that is what we see when we first see thinning of the skin from steroids, if we see them at all totally reversible. If parents don't know to look for that or haven't heard of that or just miss it, then I'll describe with the, the back of my hand uh, senile thinning of the skin, just th thinning of the skin, that cigarette paper atrophy from age. Sadly, not reversible for me, but if created by topical steroids, entirely reversible. If you treat through that, you can get a stretch mark or a scar. So I absolutely encourage parents to continue their vigilance and their respect for the fact that a topical steroid is a medication, but it's not one that you need to fear because they can own the risk 
They know what to look for. They know what to find if steroid thinning is going to occur before it is irreversible. And to me, that increases compliance because it lets parents know uh, that they're in control. Well, what about the topical calcineurin inhibitors? There can be a little bit of application site stinging associated with their use, as there can with any topical product. And there is a black box warning associated with their use that scares off a lot of parents, uh, though it's one that we can usually put into context and make them realize generally is not something that we, we worry too much about as providers. The black box warning basically came about because the topical calcineurin inhibitors were approved around 2000, 2001. They've been around nearly 20 years. But when they first came out, they were the first non-steroidal class that actually worked for, for atopic dermatitis. So they were prescribed uh, oftentimes for infants. They've never been approved for use under two years of age. And the FDA saw that and came out with a warning in 2005 saying, do not use these as first-line therapy. Do not use these in kids under two years of age. And that black box warning oftentimes scares off parents and patients who might otherwise benefit from their use. Well, the last kit on the block, as I said, crisoprolol or a topical phosphodiesterase inhibitor. There are others in the pipeline like it, but this is the only one available to this point, is a non-steroidal topical. It does not have a box warning. However, it oftentimes has quite a bit of stinging associated with its use. As we talked about, can happen with any topical agent, but it has been uh, definitely a barrier to the use of crisoprolol as often as we'd like, particularly on the face where we like non-steroidal products. How do we mitigate these things? Well, first of all, you can cool the medications. You can put them in the refrigerator. Sometimes that helps. You can mix them with a topical emollient, with, cut them with Vaseline, put one to one in your hand, makes them a little bit less potent. You don't know exactly how well they're going to work uh, or as reliably because you're mixing it up with an emollient, but it can mitigate the stinging. If the skin is in better shape to begin with, there's less stinging no matter what you use. Kids with really inflamed atopic dermatitis, cracks, breaks in their skin, put on a moisturizing lotion. Most lotions have a little alcohol in them. They sting like crazy. So anything can sting, and the more healed the barrier is, the better off the barrier is, the less stinging there's going to be. So if you think that, gosh, we need this product by definition to treat inflamed skin, you do, but oftentimes topical steroids sting a little less, get the skin in better shape, you need the topical calcineurin inhibitors and the topical phosphodiesterase inhibitors less to get inflammation under control than to keep it there sustainably. Get that skin under better shape with the topical steroids and then keep them there with sustainable use of a non-steroid. You'll have better results, uh, you'll sting less, and that's something that we do all the time. Well, what about if topical agents are not enough? These are moderate to severe patients and their lives are turned upside down by atopic dermatitis, as you've heard. They lose sleep, they itch constantly, they get skin infections, they don't feel as though they can go outside uh, and wear what they wanna wear or do what they wanna do, either because of the visible stigma or because literally engaging in their activity like playing on a grass field causes them to have worse symptoms. So these are kids who we need other agents for and for all too long, we have not had great options, but we're fortunately in a better place. But before we ever entertain treating with a systemic agent of any kind, I think it's critical that we assure compliance because as we've already talked about, steroid phobia is a huge barrier and one that's not always articulated to we the provider. And so you need to explore that because there's a dynamic there where you see a patient come back and they're worse or not better and so you think, oh gosh, we, we should probably use a stronger steroid. And if the reason they're not better is the parents or the patient was afraid of using that steroid and they just didn't articulate that to you, well then giving them a stronger steroid is the exact opposite of what you wanna do. So ensure compliance before you move on to systemic therapy. Rule out other diagnoses. Patients with atopic dermatitis have a greater risk of food allergy. You've heard Dr. Gupta's presentation. Patients with atopic dermatitis are more likely to have allergic contact dermatitis from things like nickel in their belt buckles or their earrings uh, or fragrances in any products they might use. Eliminate those because looking at a contact rash, an allergic contact dermatitis rash, 
it doesn't really look any different than atopic dermatitis. You biopsy it, it looks identical to atopic dermatitis. So it's really the story, perhaps a distribution that suggests a different diagnosis or sometimes appropriate testing. So absolutely think of those things before you move on knee jerk to systemic therapies. Well, what if we're there? What if we're there to a patient who has failed topical therapy, they absolutely have atopic dermatitis and no competing diagnoses, and they're being fully compliant with your medications to the best of your knowledge? Well, until 2017, we had one US FDA approved systemic therapy for atopic dermatitis, and that was systemic prednisone. If you ask a panel of allergists, dermatologists, pediatricians, what their least favorite systemic therapy for atopic dermatitis is, prednisone, uniformly. Why? Well, in part because it's seductively effective. Three days after getting on systemic uh, prednisone, a patient with atopic dermatitis is gonna be sleeping better, less rash, looking like a million bucks. Three days after they come off systemic steroids, they're gonna be possibly worse than when they started. And you cannot stay on systemic steroids because of side effects. So though it's an option and sometimes we have to use it, it is not one any of us like using ever for atopic dermatitis. So we've had some options, cyclosporin, methotrexate, mycophenolate, azathioprine. These are all systemic immunomodulatory or immunosuppressive medications that work very broadly. They suppress inflammation in the skin and we have inflammation in our skin and in our body for a reason. We have inflammation in our skin to fight off infections, to make us better. Well, if you suppress that broadly, you may well help the inflammation's effects in the skin, but you may well cause side effects from the inflammation that was supposed to help our body. So broadly immunosuppressive medications risk infections and other side effects that essentially limit their ability to be used in any ongoing way for atopic dermatitis. So what we've needed for many years was a more targeted, uh, more effective therapy that both treated the inflammation of the atopic dermatitis, but only the inflammation of the atopic dermatitis, and therefore limited the amount of side effects that were seen. Well, since 2017, we've had the very first molecule that actually fit that description, and that's dupilumab. Dupilumab was approved in 2017 for adults. It's now approved down to 12 years of age, and studies are ongoing in younger children still. Dupilumab is an injectable biologic medication taken every other week that targets a specific molecule cascade, IL-4 and IL-13, that is critical in the inflammatory cascade of atopic dermatitis. And when I introduce this therapy, I'll have sort of a, a, a situation where kids are a little bit disheartened sometimes to hear that it's a shot, but then they hear that it's only every other week, and then they hear there's no blood test monitoring like they had had to have with the other therapies, and oftentimes, even before they realize how effective it can be, they are on board. This medication is not free of side effects altogether. No medication is. This medication can have injection site reactions, as any injectable can. This medication can have effects on the eyes. Conjunctivitis, or inflammation of the eyes, has been a significant side effect with dupilumab, happening in around 10% of the adult trial patients, and one that we seem to see more in patients who come into the medication with pre-existing eye disease. 8% of patients with atopic dermatitis uh, have pre-existing eye disease, uh, keratoconjunctivitis uh, for one, and it is in those patients where you need to be very careful and monitor uh, to make sure they're not getting exacerbation of their eye disease, and if they do, get that addressed immediately. So you can keep that arrow in your quiver. You can keep them on the dupilumab if they have that problem. Well, the pipeline for atopic dermatitis is unlike it's been in the 20 plus years I've treated this condition. When both the crisoprol and the dupilumab were approved, prior to that, from 2000 to 2017, there are essentially no new molecules approved for atopic dermatitis. Now, since 2017, we have two. There are upwards of 15 injectable medications at phase two development or beyond a similar number of systemic oral treatments, a similar number of topical treatments. So it's an incredibly exciting time to be taking care of patients with atopic dermatitis because the treatments are getting more targeted. We've already described with dupilumab why that makes such a difference. There's a class of medications called JAK inhibitors, which are one of the more further along agents in the pipeline. They're both topical and systemic JAK inhibitors in development. 
and these and others are hopefully going to make the care of atopic dermatitis even better. So in conclusion, you've heard from both uh, Aiden, uh, who told a, a, a poignant story about his own experience with atopic dermatitis. You've heard from Dr. Gupta, a pediatrician who's on the front lines of taking care of this disease, both from the standpoint of atopic dermatitis and food allergy. And now we've talked a bit about the treatments to try and address uh, this condition. And so we started off by saying how much we hated the two words, just eczema, when paired together. I don't think if you've watched this program at all, uh, it's something that you would ever put together again, because you've seen how impactful it can be for patients by hearing Aiden. You've seen all of the things that can kind of go along for the ride by hearing Dr. Gupta's presentation. And now you've heard some of the things that can help to address it. And so my hope is that uh, through all of our efforts and the ongoing pipeline of new medications, we will do better for the patients with atopic dermatitis in the future. Thank you very much. Hello, this is Dr. Sid Berry. I hope you've all enjoyed these presentations, which have been aimed to provide unique perspectives on living with, diagnosing, and treating atopic dermatitis. Dr. Gupta and I are excited to answer your questions, so please make sure you submit them in the space provided. Dr. Gupta, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Let's get started with our first question. Are there any primary prevention strategies for atopic dermatitis? I think that's a great question. It's always great to start any medical discussion, I think, with the idea of prevention when possible. In the case of atopic dermatitis, there just is not any known primary prevention just yet. That is not to say that that is not a question that's been studied in depth. Everything's been looked at in terms of certain food restriction during pregnancy, in breastfeeding mothers, limiting solid foods before introduction to try and prevent atopic dermatitis, and the list goes on and on. And there really has been nothing that has been shown to prevent atopic dermatitis. I will say in the last couple of years, there's been an exciting look at something as simple as really moisturizing very aggressively in high-risk kids starting as soon as three weeks of age and then looking to see if just really aggressive moisturization with a good emollient early on can actually prevent the development of atopic dermatitis later. And there's some suggestion that that is possible, though that's certainly not been confirmed yet and further study is needed. So that, to me, is the most exciting avenue that's being looked at right now. Dr. Gupta, have you had any other thoughts about primary prevention in atopic dermatitis? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sudbury. I would say exactly what you said, and one of the big things that's being looked at is if we really protect that skin barrier, you know, as early as possible, as you said, can we not only prevent further atopic derm, but can we stop the atopic march and really prevent all the things that come after, including allergies and asthma. So I think it's an exciting time. I do agree that the earlier that you can truly protect that skin barrier and really use emollients to decrease, you know, the intensity of the atopic derm, it's really critical. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And wouldn't that be extraordinary if something as simple as really applying a moisturizer early and often not only prevented atopic dermatitis or even decreased its intensity, but even might mitigate things like asthma or allergic rhinitis. So that is super exciting. Dr. Gupta, given your expertise in this area, a viewer wrote in two questions, but they're related. So I'll ask both together. First is, what is the role of food allergies in exacerbating or controlling atopic dermatitis? And then a related question, how often do food allergies contribute to atopic dermatitis flares and which foods are frequently culprits? Thank you. This is a really challenging question because a lot of our thought around this has been changing. So foods can have been shown to increase exacerbations of atopic derm. However, it's very difficult to assess food allergies based on exacerbations of atopic derm. Typically, you know, when we think of a food allergic reaction, we think of something that happens rapidly in onset, and skin things are more around hives and itching and flushing, and, you know, then you can have all the other symptoms, including, you know, GI symptoms of vomiting and nausea and stomach pains. But then you can have cardiovascular symptoms, drop in blood pressure. Oftentimes you have respiratory symptoms, you know, trouble breathing, throat tightening. So the fact that food allergic reactions can impact pretty much any organ system makes it quite complicated to say, do certain foods cause exacerbations of eczema? 
A lot of times also we think, especially in infants, if their eczema is getting worse, we need to protect that skin barrier and use emollients and medications to protect that first and keep foods in an infant's diet. The LEAP study, which was a landmark study published in the New England Journal, found that in these high-risk infants with severe eczema, if you introduce peanut products into their diets early, so around four to six months, you could potentially prevent peanut allergy from developing. So something this taught us was in these infants with severe eczema, we really do need to keep certain foods in their diet because they may have a higher likelihood of developing that food allergy if they stop eating it. I think the bottom line is, you know, if it's just eczema, let's work harder on protecting that skin barrier with emollients and, you know, talk to your dermatologist about how to best protect the skin, but don't necessarily take the food out of your diet. It's just so complex. And I think part of it is that parents oftentimes with their infants who are itching and have rash and are struggling to sleep, they so desperately want to exert some element of control and who wouldn't when faced with that situation. And that's one very natural thing is to think that it's got to be something in the diet. And, And as you rightly say, sometimes it is, but many times it isn't. And what I tend to do is just, you know, as you've said and implied before, is you just take a good history, start there. And if there's not a clear connection between flares and food exposures, then I like to focus on good skin care first and foremost and without changing the diet. And if then kids get quite a bit better, oftentimes those food allergy questions will sort of drift to the background, but there's no doubt it's a challenging question. So thank you for submitting that. We'll move on to the next question. This is a very practical one. Atopic dermatitis in an infant is particularly difficult to manage, especially on the face. What pearls can you experts provide to help other providers with this problem? And it's, you know, spot on. It's something that we see very frequently. And not only in an infant is that a prominent location for atopic dermatitis, period. It's often, you know, one of the things that we think exacerbates atopic dermatitis is sort of that wet, dry cycle. Places that tend to stay moist all the time, like the axillary vault, tend to do better. Places that tend to get wet and dry cyclically, like a thumb that's being sucked or cheeks that are being drooled on or a chest that's being constantly saturated with a bib and then intermittently dried, those places are really, really stubborn. And that's just a form of irritancy, irritation from the wetting and drying. And so one simple thing that I'll have parents do is to apply a nice coat of some sort of barrier, some petrolatum-based barrier, generally fairly thick, around the mouth before meals. And then the child eats and inevitably food and drool and saliva get on the face and the chest. But in that case, there's a barrier to protect the skin. And then after the meal's over, clean them up, another coat of the barrier, and off they go. And it's a way that can really mitigate that wet, dry cycle and the irritancy that contributes to that stubborn facial dermatitis. Is that along the lines of what you might recommend, Dr. Gupta? Yes, absolutely. And I had this in my daughter. My daughter had terrible atopic derm everywhere, but the face was especially challenging because it's difficult to use you know, the steroids that may get into their eyes or mouth, and you have to be so careful. But the nice thing to know also is the face does go away the quickest, or where you see atopic derm as you grow up changes. You know, So the face is very prominent in infants, but they do tend to grow out of that early, and then it goes into other areas, of course. There is hope, but I love your suggestion, Dr. Sidbury. Yeah, that is a ray of hope down the line that as kids drool less and more of the food gets in the mouth instead of on the face, that that is always a helpful step. Okay, well, let's move on. You mentioned the use of topical steroids. That's a nice segue to another question that often comes up, and one of our viewers tonight has submitted the question, how long a period can topical therapy, and in this case, not specifically steroids called out, but that's certainly one of the topical therapies. How long can topical therapy be prescribed for atopic dermatitis? And a related question that is more steroid specific, when should steroid use be, quote, stepped down and how frequently can they be used before considering something else? What sorts of recommendations do you make there, Dr. Gupta? 
Wow. I would love to hear your responses to that. But I do want to say just from the pediatric standpoint, a lot of times moving up on steroids is not common nature, right? Like So with things changing as they are and the real importance of protecting that skin barrier, I think educating families too, you know, if it's not getting better, then you definitely do need to step up more quickly. And again, especially in infants to really keep that barrier protected. And then get them to a dermatologist. So I really do advocate for families who have severe atopic derm and pediatricians kind of used everything they have in their wheelhouse, get them to a dermatologist earlier so that they can really get, you know, maximum management of their atopic derm. Taking that first question, how long a period can topical therapy be prescribed for atopic dermatitis? That's a really hard question, right? Because if there were a finite period of time, that would be saying that basically there's a finite period of time that atopic dermatitis exists. And while kids may well grow out of it, that may happen neither you nor I nor anyone else can tell the parents when that will be. And so I do sometimes see parents come in frustrated when they've been told, okay, here's this topical steroid and you can only use it for two weeks. And they will tell me, well, gosh, it did seem to help. There was less itching, there was less rash, but I couldn't use it for more than two weeks. And sure enough, the atopic dermatitis isn't going away in two weeks. So I do think we need to be really intentional about pointing out that these medications can be used longer than two weeks. We just need to make sure that there are intermittent breaks. And if you want to say, okay, you have an overall goal of using it less than two weeks out of each month, as long as it's a safe, appropriate topical steroid for the area involved, so a lower potency agent for the face, maybe a mid potency agent for the trunk or extremities, then with that degree of a break, you're going to be fine. But point out to parents that eczema is not going to behave uh, every 15 day schedule. You know, some weeks it's going to be twice a day for, you know, every day for that week. Some weeks it's going to be, you know, we were able to use it for three days on and then we took three days off. Yeah. And so kids are going to have flares and parents have to have the flexibility to respond to that flare without being too constrained by these well-intentioned messages of steroid safety. So I just try to tell parents, you know, be willing to use them, you know, twice a day for two, three weeks if you need to get a flare under control, but then try to back down. And if backing down to just a moisturizer and taking a break with a moisturizer is inadequate and they cannot get breaks, well, then it's, you know, it's our job to find a non steroidal option that might be a break from steroids, but not necessarily a break from treatment. Right. And I think that education that you're talking about is so critical and often times you don't have time to do it in a busy pediatric clinic. And so the idea that you have to use it twice a day, you know, for two weeks is not necessarily the message. The message is you got to get rid of the flare and then you can switch back to emollients. And then if you need it again, then start up again. But, you know, the parents have to monitor that, you know, how severe is it? Am I getting it under control? When can I switch for a while? When do I need to start back up? And that whole conversation can be complicated because they're so used to us saying, okay, take this antibiotic for seven days or 10 days and do it regularly, you know? And so for eczema treatment, it's a little bit different. It's kind of parental monitoring of that child's eczema and where it is in the process. They're making these decisions where, okay, it's clear now. We switch to emollients. And then if it does flare up again, I start back. And yeah, I think it's a little bit more challenging because now the parent is in charge of that treatment. I think we're running low on time, but we probably have time for one more question. And this is one that comes up a lot. And that's the question of the role of bleach baths for atopic dermatitis. And this is a story which first came on a radar screen about 10 years ago and now has gained quite a bit of traction. Maybe in the interest of time, I'll ask you, Dr. Gupta, first, do you incorporate bleach baths into your routine care of patients with atopic dermatitis? So it depends on the patient, but definitely for the stubborn atopic derm that's not really getting better quickly with treatment. And, you know, the group that did that is from my hospital, so I'm very proud of that study. But I have seen significant improvement with it in certain patients. So I'm a fan of it, but not in every child. Yeah, and I'm a believer too. I I really am. And I think I love the way you put that because eczema, if anything, atopic dermatitis, if anything, is an individual condition. And though there are foundational bedrock principles, which have been highlighted nicely in these videos and in our discussions, there are also a lot of differences from patient to patient. And one size doesn't always fit all. But 
in general, I love bleach baths a couple times a week, really as prevention more than treatment. So that's one message I always try to get across that it's not something to start up, oh my gosh, my child's flaring, let's start the bleach baths. It's something, oh my gosh, my child's doing well. Let's see if we can put this bath additive in that will help us minimize the need to use prescription medications. So that's really how I tend to use bleach baths. That wraps it up. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta, for your wonderful insight. And we would really like to also thank all of you for your questions. You can also download the slides and the practice aids, as well as apply for CME credit. We encourage you to join the conversation on Twitter by following at PeerReview. And thank you again for participating. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerreview.com forward slash XHY860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Pfizer. This activity has been jointly provided by the University of Florida College of Medicine and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.